Welcome to the Technology Pill, a podcast that looks at how technology is reshaping our lives every day, and particularly the power of governments and companies. My name is Gus Hossein, and I'm the Executive Director of Privacy International. In this podcast, I have the extraordinary honor to speak to two experts who work every day on questions of identity in Kenya. And the topic for today is looking at this question of identity and identity systems. Normally, you would imagine that an organization like PI, when it approaches questions of identity, it'd be like identity cards are bad, governments should get rid of ID systems. And yet today's discussion looks at how identity systems are a lived reality and how we actually have to help people to get within an identity system because right now these identity systems are designed to exclude. I'm so honored to welcome Karen Weitzberg and Yusuf Bashir to the podcast. Karen is an academic who specializes on identity systems and is a fellow at University College London, close to my heart, actually. She, she's an expert on science and technology studies, which is an area that I studied many, many, many years ago. But also she's an expert on migration studies and critical race studies, looking at East Africa in particular. And Yusuf is the executive director at Hacking a Sharia Initiative, which is a non-governmental organization based in northern Kenya. They're essentially a human rights group that promotes the participation of marginalized communities in governance. Karen and Yusuf, maybe you could tell us what got you into looking at these issues. Sure. Well, I've been doing research in East Africa, specifically in Kenya, for over a decade. My first book focused on Somali transnational networks, and I did a lot of interviews with Kenyan Somalis, Kenyan citizens who identify as Somalis. And an issue that kept coming up was the question of identity cards. Many people were struggling to access IDs. Many people equated their feelings of political marginalization with their difficulty, the discrimination they faced in accessing IDs. And at the very same time, in the years that I had been coming to Kenya, I'd also seen a proliferation of biometric technologies in the country. So that's what really got me interested in, in the intersections between migration and digital identity and biometrics. And it's really through my research that I also met Yusuf. Okay, so my name is uh, Yusuf Bashir. I am um, a Kenyan lawyer. And the reason why I got involved in this is because I was born and brought up in Garissa in the north and I'm ethnically Somali. So this is a problem that I have grown up with and I am very familiar with. So I'd like to start this conversation by discussing the issue that you, Karen, have been working on most recently and that your organization, Yusuf, Hacking a Sharia, have been dealing with on the ground, which is this question of double registration. Just to frame it, this is a situation where some Kenyan people are also registered as refugees on the refugee databases. This, in turn, creates huge barriers for them in accessing Kenya's national ID system, which is then required for them to access the most basic services in Kenya, like government support, food aid, or even opening a bank account or traveling around the country. And all of this hinges on biometrics and biometric systems like fingerprint-based systems. In 2008, I was part of an evaluation of the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, and their deployment of biometrics in the camps in Kenya and other countries. And back then, biometrics were the technology that UNHCR would say would solve all of the problems they had. And so in the context in Kenya that I was dealing with, UNHCR was under a lot of pressure to address what they were being told is fraud within the system of, of too many people in Kenya claiming to be refugees, and particularly the Kenyan Somali community. And so there were cases that UNHCR was trying to respond to of people with Kenyan citizenship trying to pretend that they were refugees in order to get access to the services and aid that refugees had the right to access. And so when UNHCR started collecting fingerprints, it was their attempt to solve double registration. Now, when 
I tried to point out to them that their database wouldn't miraculously identify these problems. The Kenyan official said, look, don't worry, Kenya's got a great ID system. We have fingerprints of every Kenyan citizen stored in a warehouse on pieces of paper. And we have expert staff who are capable of looking at a fingerprint and identifying it amongst all the other fingerprints in this warehouse. And they were so concerned about double registration, they felt like that technology had finally come to save this gross injustice that was going on. So that was 2008. And now I was reading Karen's great write-up of her research, and it was a wonderful introduction to the work that Hacking Nash Sharia is doing about the the victims of double registration. Karen, I was wondering if you could just first update us on what is the the state of play around the the dynamics of double registration in Kenya. Yeah, well, firstly, I wanted to say that's a fascinating history. And I also wanted to add that what the Kenyan officials were describing to you actually dates all the way back to the early colonial era. It's really British colonial officials who first introduced fingerprinting to Kenya. And I also wanted to say that I think the case of the UNHCR rolling out a biometric system as a way of solving this elusive problem of fraud, it shows that there are no simple techno-political solutions to complex political problems. And I think it's had a lot of unintended side effects, one of which is the double registration issue that we're talking about today. As far as where the situation is right now, and Yusuf might be able to update us in much more detail. So the Kenyan government decided after many, many years of really failing to do anything about the the victims of double registration, they finally decided to implement a vetting process to ostensibly sort out and determine who is an authentic citizen and then deregister them from the refugee database. And Haki Nashiria, as well as other civil society groups, played a really instrumental role in advocating on behalf of double registration victims and really pushing the Kenyan government to try to resolve this issue. So the vetting process, which was far from perfect, but was, I would argue, a welcome step in the right direction, it finished earlier this year. But as far as I know, the Kenyan government still has yet to formally resolve the problems. And I imagine that with the pandemic, that might be further delaying the process. Yusuf, I don't know if you have any further updates. Yes, Karen. I mean, as you rightly put it, Corona has taken over the Kenyan government and there's very little going on right now. And and this is really so sad because the government and other state actors are really using now ID cards as a means of identifying individuals who are being given food aid. And this means that everybody who's double registered who had hoped by now to have gotten their documentation do not have it and are therefore um, not able to benefit uh, from that. Your introduction was quite interesting. And and the underlying problem as it was being presented was uh, that Kenyan uh, citizens, Kenyan Somalis specifically, who are seeking to be refugees. It, it points towards failure in the um, service provision aspects of the Kenyan government, and it points towards years of neglect and exclusion by the Kenyan government in terms of access to services such as education, such as healthcare, and the biometric system came and resulted in a process whereby these people did not get any more services from UNHCR, which they thought they would get. And at the same time, they lost their nationality. Uh, They didn't, at least through administrative process such as that, essentially rendering them stateless uh, individuals. And I think that is something that's important to point out. Yeah, I just wanted to add that I think biometrics are often touted as a kind of solution to the problem of fraud. But the concept of fraud, which I I think has very derogatory connotations, doesn't really capture the complexity of people's situation on the ground. Northern Kenya is a very politically and economically marginalized region. And when the Somali civil war broke out in the late 80s, early 90s, this was right around the time that there was a major drought in northern Kenya. So many people turned to the refugee system out of desperation in order to access food aid, in order to access free education. And as Yusuf points out, because they weren't provided those services as citizens of 
Kenya. And so there's a really kind of, I would say, almost tragic irony to the fact that they were able to access better services as refugees than they were as citizens. And I also think that there is a kind of tragic irony to the fact that a refugee system, which was meant to be helping vulnerable people, helping people seeking asylum, ended up effectively rendering tens of thousands of Kenyans stateless. So I think it's really important that we, I would say, interrogate what this word fraud means and whether it's really the right term to apply to people who often choose to pass as refugees because they're under enormous constraints and often out of desperation. I hate to agree vociferously with you, uh, but that's exactly the set of issues we tried to raise back in 2008. But the environment we were dealing with was that it was post 9-11, even seven years later, but still it was post 9-11. And there was a lot of pressure from UNHCR donors, particularly the Americans and surprisingly the Dutch, around this issue of fraud and potential terrorists who might be in camps around the world. And so UNHCR came up with the ridiculous idea of biometrics, not because biometrics are inherently ridiculous, but because the funding was coming from predominantly the Dutch government. So UNHCR chose Dutch technology that had never been deployed before outside of, and I I say this with unbelievable honesty, outside of the use at bars in the Netherlands, not bars as in prisons, bars as in nightclubs. And so this technology from a vendor that was uh, used in nightclubs was all of a sudden being deployed by 2008, it was being deployed across the world. And in our evaluation, we traveled to Malaysia, we traveled to Djibouti, we were in Ethiopia, and we were in Kenya looking at how this technology was being deployed. And when you spoke to staff at UNHCR, of course, there was some mixed feelings, but generally, the, the feeling amongst professional refugee administration staff was that this technology was a godsend. Other camps that had not been given the technology were queuing up to get the technology because they thought it would solve so many problems, double registration being the top one, but other problems that might exist. And you saw essentially as this technology was reaching the camps, almost like a, a shift in the view of the staff using it where previously they might have assumed that anybody around were in need of assistance. And then they were transformed into, well, there are, there are frauds and there are non-frauds. There are legitimate and there are illegitimate. And it just completely, at least in my, from the outside, just looking at how there was this faith in the technology working, even though as we tested it in the field, the technology wasn't working, but it didn't matter because it was reshaping their views of who was legitimate and who was illegitimate. But I'm curious, as we jump forward to today versus my experiences in 2008, and they were very limited experiences. I was only in Kenya for about three to four weeks and in Dadaab and Kakuma only for a week each. Like I, I'm curious if Yusuf, you can describe what was the lived experience of somebody before this exercise? And what are some of the more positive results after all the work that you've been doing? Well, the main benefit that a lot of people get in terms of receiving uh, support from Hakim and Sharia is birth certificates and ID cards, which essentially enable them. First of all, if it's for birth certificates, enable children to go uh, to school and, and, you know, and access the education system in Kenya. Because without that, recently um, passed uh, regulations was that you cannot go to school without a birth certificate. So that is one benefit of a birth certificate. Why is that a requirement to have a birth certificate to show up at school? Was there like a widespread uh, inundation of non-birth certificate carrying kids who were like overwhelming schools across Kenya? Like what's, what's, what happened there? It's interesting how fraud is the one that pops up whenever you hear uh, a new system is about to be launched uh, in, in Kenya at least. Um, so there was a lot of fraud, quote unquote, that was being perpetrated by school administrators, whereby they were claiming that there were more students in their schools than they actually had them for purposes of increasing the amount of funding that their schools got from the government. So essentially, they introduced uh, regulations to say that all students must be given a unique 
identification number, which would be online. And, and, and to get this unique identification number, um, you must uh, have a birth certificate linked to it directly. And then schools would be allocated resources based on the number of students that have the unique identification number, which was called a NEMIS number, NEMIS. Interestingly, there is a report this year saying that this system has been a massive failure. and The government is considering to scrap it in its entirety. It's still there, but uh, there was that information sort of leaked to the press that it has, it has not been uh, beneficial at all. So I was saying about national IDs, which is essentially the main document that proves that you are a Kenyan uh, citizen you acquire at the age of 18. This document will give you access. If you want to access certain buildings, most buildings in places like Nairobi, you have to produce a national document, a national ID document. Also, if you want to open a bank account, even something as simple as mobile money, or a mobile SIM card. The other thing that you need it for is to join a uh, university. And, and if these individuals uh, who, who apply for it at the age of 18, they have just finished high school and normally are seeking higher education. For them to even access those universities and colleges, there is one university in Garissa, uh, which is for the whole region, but it only serves as a, as a university that caters for education, like it trains teachers only. So if you want to study anything other than teaching, you have to come to Nairobi uh, from that region. And to come to Nairobi, if you are above the age of 18, or if you look like you're above the age of 18, you cannot come because there are so many barriers by, set up by police and military officials who stop you and ask you for this document. If you don't have this document, you're going straight to jail uh, and you're not going to Nairobi or anywhere else for that matter. So this is why these documents are essentially vital to live in these regions. And there are regular patrols that are also conducted by police. So if you don't, if you don't produce this document upon demand, you also get, get arrested. So Hakina Sharia has been helping uh, these communities through paralegals, community-based individuals who we have trained on the law and the procedures. And they help these communities make the necessary applications for these documents because they are very technical and there are a lot of steps that need to be undertaken. And these communities don't get any support from the government. So our paralegals help them go through that process so that they acquire these, uh, these documents. So last year, we helped over 700 individuals acquire birth certificates in Garissa, which essentially is not a big number, but it's massive considering our small stature as an organization. And we also helped over 300 people acquire national identity cards as well. So that is the kind of work that we do as an organization. That's absolutely extraordinary. And those numbers, I, I would never downplay them. Those are extraordinary numbers for people, which it sounds like they get their lives as a result of these documents and as a result of the work you do. Karen, I was wondering if you could explain why is the government behaving in this way? What is it that, like you, you say that historically the identity system was one established in the colonial era, like so many of these administrative systems that all of a sudden become, well, not all of a sudden, they were designed to be burdensome and to separate to how it is now. Like in other countries, particularly in Africa, using the example of Ghana, over the past 20 years, they've had like four different identity systems. What is it within Kenya that this, uh, this identity system is so entrenched to the point where in order to have justice, we need to make sure people are within the identity system? Yeah, that's a great question. Can I firstly say, just in response to what Yusuf was talking about in regards to birth certificates, when I was last in Kenya, I also was doing some interviews with members of the Nubian population of Kenya, who, like Somalis, have faced historic discrimination in accessing identity documents. And I work with one woman who is struggling to get her son a birth certificate in order to enroll him in what's known as Form 2 in the Kenyan school system. And it was just amazing watching her try to navigate this very callous, very Kafkaesque bureaucracy. I ended up actually accompanying her to what's known as Bishop House, which is where people get birth certificates in Nairobi. In the end, she was successful, which was great. But we also spoke to one woman there. We struck up a conversation with her. She had been waiting for five years to get a birth certificate for her child. So 
this constant demand for legal documents really has a huge potential to exclude people, especially people who have faced historic discrimination within the country. As to your original question, so one thing I would say is I think we tend to think of biometrics as this very new, very cutting edge technology, but it's, I think, really important to think about the longer history of biometrics. Biometrics is originally a British imperial invention. If we think about what remains today the most common, most popular form of biometrics, which is fingerprinting, it originated in the late 19th century and it really evolved in colonial India, in colonial South Africa, before in a sense making its way back home to the metropole where it was applied to criminalized populations. So fingerprinting came to Kenya during the British colonial era in the early 20th century. And it was first used really to regulate predominantly male African migrant laborers and to enforce a system of racial segregation, a system of racial capitalism in Kenya. So it has this very long fraught history that I think is important to keep in the back of one's mind. And I think that once Kenya gained independence in 1963, IDs actually initially were not all that important. They became more important in more recent years. I would say actually particularly since 9-11, we've seen partly out of you know, securitization reasons, there's been a kind of growing emphasis on IDs. But one of the ways that this has played out in Kenya, but I also think we see parallel examples of this in other parts of the world, is that groups of people who are second, third class citizens, who are not perceived to fully belong to the nation state, they have much more difficulty accessing IDs. And Somalis are among these people, uh, these populations, who really don't have equal access. One example of this is when Typically at age 18, as a Kenyan, you apply for a national ID. And for certain communities, this is a relatively straightforward process for the most part. But other communities, what are often referred to as border communities, often predominantly Muslim communities, they have to go through a vetting process, which can be very invasive, very humiliating, where they essentially have to prove that they're genuine Kenyan citizens that they're not foreigners, that they're not refugees. So there's very much this, I would say, tiered system that's built into the process of getting an ID in Kenya. Now, if you look at where where Kenya is at, there's all this debate and all this uh, interesting discourse around a new ID system now. And I was wondering if either of you could describe what is the new ID system and why did I have to read in the New York Times about this ID system and why was there a court case around it? Well, I think Kenya is a really, I would say, almost canary in the coal mine case of the dangers of building centralized, easily shareable biometric databases. And I think we see this in the case of the UNHCR building this centralized biometric database that it unfortunately has started to share with third parties like the Kenyan government who don't necessarily have the interests of refugees in mind. And now what we're seeing is the building of a centralized biometric national database by the Kenyan government, which is very similar to the Adar system in India. There's some notable differences, but it's modeled in many ways after Adar. And it is a system that has yet to really be fully implemented, but the idea is that each Kenyan would get a unique identity number and a smart ID. And this identity number is known as Huduma number, which in Swahili means service number. And from the very beginning, a number of groups, a number of civil human rights and civil society groups have contested the constitutionality of this system of Huduma number. And I think Yusuf actually could speak to this in far more detail than I can, as he is one of the lead lawyers representing one of the the groups that is challenging Huduma number in court at the moment and arguing that it's an exclusionary system. 
Yes, the reason why uh, NIMS, as has been described, was a major problem for several minority communities was what we described. The current system is exclusionary, whereby individuals who come from certain communities are denied these documents or are forced to undergo um, extensive arbitrary vetting procedures, which are essentially, you know, uh, highly uh, security oriented. And, and you're basically almost being grilled by security officers in order to prove that you're a Kenyan. And, and there are lots of delays as well. So the current system results in exclusion of a lot of people. For example, for birth certificates, the percentage of people in Garissa or, or children in Garissa who have birth certificates hangs at around 30%. So 70% of children in Garissa don't have access to birth certificates. And that has a knock-on effect on access to education and access to literacy levels uh, in Garissa, uh, which is interesting that even the literacy levels in Garissa is, you know, is about 15, 20%. The number of people who have access to documents and the number of people who are literate have this matching effect. So the government came up with this NIMS system, which, which they called the National Integrated Identity Management System, which essentially is a digitized, centralized database, which would solve all the challenges of previous paper-based systems that the government has rolled out. So there are various generations of, of IDs, and this was supposed to be the latest one and uh, you know, the silver bullet that would solve all the problems. It would bring together various databases that are currently separate, including the one for tax, so Kenya Revenue Authority, including the one for um, driving licenses, the one for um, national uh, NSSF, which is National Social Security Fund, including the health. So all these different databases that are being run separately would now be linked uh, with this master database, which is being called the Huduma database, whereby, as Karen described, there would be a special number that would link all of them. So these communities challenge the constitutionality, and Haki Nasheri was involved in this process uh, because I was the lead counsel for the first petitioner. And we sort of agreed that we should use the, the Nubian community as the face of the case because the Nubian community has had a very long history of being involved in litigation against the Kenyan government because they are based in Nairobi. They're not based anywhere near a border. For example, someone could claim that Somalis are based in Somalia and in Kenya, and therefore the government needs to take extra precautions. But the Nubians are based in the heart of the country, which is in the capital city, yet they are exposed to these rigorous vetting procedures. They have problems in acquiring birth certificates. And they have gone to various international bodies, such as the African Commission uh, and also the African Committee on Rights and Welfare of the Child, and they have gotten favorable decisions. And, and it sort of made sense to have the Nubians be the face of this case. So we filed this case uh, on that basis, but also we filed it on other grounds, such as right to privacy, which a centralized database that is interlinked with several other databases would pose a tremendous risk to Kenyans in terms of their rights to privacy. And there are a lot of concerns about issues such as surveillance, which we raised in the, in, in the high court. We were partially successful and the court did point out the issues of exclusion to be looked at. The court also pointed out that the government had to pass regulations that manage the system the court gave them the right to go forward with it, but only if they passed these regulations that made the system constitutional. Uh, one of the interesting sort of results of this case was that the government hurriedly uh, passed through a data protection law, which is mirrored uh, to some extent on the uh, European uh, GDPR as a, one of the mechanisms to defeat our case, because one of the limbs of the case was that the government does not have adequate safeguards in terms of data protection laws in order to roll out such a system. But the government rushed through parliament record time and the president assented to it, a data protection law, which we have now, but still yet to be operationalized. We have instructions from uh, our clients, the Nubians, uh, to appeal the decision. And the specific concern that we have is the right to have them go forward with the system. And, and the fact that the court also refused to look at issues of the system design whether the system being centralized or decentralized and siloed, whether those kinds of issues are issues that a court uh, should go into. And our argument was that this is something that goes to the heart of the case, because if 
uh, a system is designed in a way that enables the user to, to violate people's rights, it doesn't matter how many uh, laws you pass. So it's important that the technology is severely limited in the way it's designed uh, in order to make sure that people's rights are not infringed upon with regard to the issue of privacy. I can continue talking, but I think I should stop there. I love that point that it doesn't matter how many laws you pass. I just want to close this off just by asking two final questions. The first is, 9-11 drove a lot of these innovations all those years ago. And now we're at this COVID moment where there's the immediate aftermath of COVID about making sure that people have the services they need. But I'm, I'm also curious, what happens in six months' time? What happens in a year's time when our global economy is going to have to be rebuilt and we're going to be ever more reliant upon government? And yet government's going to have even fewer resources. The the the, the cause célèbre of all these identity systems being fraud, that's not going away anytime soon. And in fact, it's going to become even more problematic. And I recall reading news coverage of just a few weeks ago where Kenyan ministers were saying that this new ID system would, would help in the COVID environment. Is this going to get even more challenging? It's a great question. I think that even before the pandemic, we saw a big push for biometric and digital identity systems from a whole range of actors, including international organizations like the World Bank. And whereas I think in the immediate years post 9-11, the idea was that biometrics could be deployed to counter terrorism, to identify elusive non-state actors uh, for better border security. In more recent years, Biometrics are being touted as a route towards greater financial inclusion, towards more transparent elections in order to fulfill the UN sustainable development goal of providing a legal identity to all by 2030. So biometrics, it's really amazing to watch that it's how biometrics have proliferated and been proposed as a solution to a whole range of problems. And As we see in the case of Huduma number, very often these systems are rolled out in very haphazard ways without necessary consideration for the risks. Often these systems are rolled out in ways that almost treat countries like Kenya as blank slates that don't consider the the long, very fraught history of identification within countries and the potential for exclusion. But Your question about how the pandemic is going to change things, I absolutely think the pandemic is going to just accelerate this trend that we've already seen towards more and more biometric, as well as digital identity systems more broadly. And in many ways, the countries in the global south, like Kenya, have long been kind of testing grounds for a lot of these technologies. Yusuf, I'd love to hear your perspective on what you think is changing in Kenya with the pandemic and how you feel about being the testing ground for all these technologies. As Karen said, I mean, the times such as these when emergencies are in place and people are fearful, government always use as an opportunity to push rights violation as far as, you know, um, as they can and, and to infringe on people's rights and, 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 and the right to privacy is always one of the first rights that goes out of the window when people are scared. Because simple people want to conform and hopefully, you know, everyone is is sort of in this frame of mind where they say, let's just get through this together. You know, there's this narrative that, that is spun whereby anyone who opposes any steps that are being taken by the government at this stage is looked upon as someone who wants to kill all of us or something like that. So it's, um, even, you even notice this in the, in the WhatsApp groups. If you ask for accountability in terms of the way the government is handling COVID funds or whatever, um, there are always a lot of people who are ordinary citizens but would be very quick to, uh, to hit back and say, you know, human rights activists are always criticizing or you're always opposing the government. And, and these are not the times when you should do that. So one of the things that has already sort of popped up as a result of that is that The government is using information from telecom service providers in order to track and trace people who have been infected. And and, and it was even in the the newspapers that this is how they're doing it. And this is 
being done despite the fact that you know uh, the courts are not really uh, operational because you know uh, judges are concerned about being infected with with a virus and therefore there are no judicial oversight over such processes the government is just going straight to the telcos and asking for this information and uh, these companies are providing this information in terms of tracking people like that so the concerns that we raised around surveillance are really coming to fruition during this uh, covid times and and as you said the government is already using covid as an example of pesky uh, civil society types who don't want uh, the government to acquire good id systems that would be very useful for identifying people during covid for purposes of providing them with food rations and food aid and they're having a lot of difficulties presumably according to the government if if they don't have the nim system the huduma number uh, would have really helped a lot it would have saved a lot of money but all this is um, these are just excuses um, that the government is using in order to become stronger or you know to to have uh, more authority over people's lives which is something that governments such as ours always strive to do throughout you know their existence and it's it's just such a disappointment that as you as you so perfectly put it like in these moments of crises people uh, have the sentiment of let's get through this together and yet that protection of the community that communal thinking is going to be used by authorities to build systems that watch everybody and build systems that exclude very specifically and very targetedly some people and so this this wonderful warm moment that we're all having as as humans is going to be destroyed by the administrative and technical ambitions of the powers that be i, I just i got to say thank you so much to both of you for for joining for this conversation like you got the impression whether we like it or not and i hope we will like it that, that the world is somehow going to be rebuilt anew as a result of the 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 pandemic and the crisis that that we find ourselves in and and i'm just so happy to know that there are people like you who are going to be with us on the other side of this whether it's helping to build the world anew or fighting to make sure that it's it's still fair for everyone and uh, yes right now trust in government institutions is high because that's what we do when we are afraid or when we are nervous or when we are worried when that starts to fall and people see with fresh eyes what was done in these moments they're going to want something new and i i look forward as i said to us all being there and as we were having this conversation and i'm looking at the window i saw a single plane fly through the air and it's almost as much as that might bring environmental disaster it also offers the opportunity that maybe we will all be together again someday relatively soon and i'm looking forward to that thank you both very much thank you thank, thank you, you. If you want to get involved with the issues we discussed today, you can come to the PI website and look at all the resources we have that looks at identity and biometric systems and also our response to governments and companies responses to COVID-19. So come to our website at privacyinternational.org, sign up to our mailings where you'll find out more about the work as it's occurring. Go to action.privacyinternational.org. And of course, you can follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, and we're on Facebook, and we're also on YouTube. And as you've probably now become accustomed, while we have these monthly long-form podcasts, you'll be hearing from us in the next few weeks with shorter-form podcasts where we discuss the latest news around COVID or other types of developments that are going on. So please continue to follow this podcast, and you'll be hearing from us again soon. The music is courtesy of Sepia, and this podcast was produced by Max Burnell for Privacy International.